1997, director Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin was released to negative reviews. Boy, was I shocked by the new Batman movie. Yeah, I would give it two stars. How many would you uh, give? That's it? exactly what I'm giving, Roger. Okay, fine. It's like there's a pinball machine with all five balls on the machine well at the same time. It was the campy, neon-tinged death knell for the cycle of Batman's big screen adventures that had begun with Tim Burton's 1989 classic. It was also the beginning of a fallow period for the Cape Crusader that would see him absent from movie theaters for eight years. The honest answer is we saw that that version had run its course and that we were going to have to embrace another course. We were disappointed in the financial realities of what occurred with it, although we actually made a, a little bit of money. So it wasn't like we were coming from the point of view of, oh my God, what a disaster, oh, what are we going to do, oh, we lost all this money. It was more a recognition of creatively we had run out of room on that direction. It's Batman. So many people have to approve anything to do with a, with a, with a trademark of that value that the odds are that anything is going to be squashed. We were a little ahead of the curve, I think, in the sense of like, we were prepared to investigate a few different directions as opposed to one. And one of the most intriguing of these would-be Batman movies was surely Darren Aronofsky and Frank Miller's Batman Year One, conceived as a violent, low-budget, R-rated version of the Dark Knight's legend that was more French connection and taxi driver than superhero adventure. The version he did, and Frank, is very true and very interesting. It just happened to ultimately be far too dark. This is the story of year one, the Batman movie that almost was. Interior, Bruce Wayne's apartment, night. The TV news plays in the background as Bruce applies a fake scar onto his cheek. Bruce VO. November 8th, dear father, the pimp knew my face. A distracting scar will hopefully mask my identity. Bruce puts on the overcoat and wide-brimmed concealing hat. Tonight I begin your revenge. I will rid this city of its cancer. I will draw the scum to me and make them pay. Bruce holds up his fist and on it, his father's signet ring. Father, tonight I am declaring war. Your loving son, Bruce. Before Batman and Robin was released, a fifth film in that series was under consideration. George Clooney was under contract to return to the Cape and Cal, and a script was written featuring the Scarecrow and Harley Quinn, the daughter of the Joker in this incarnation. Variously referred to as Batman Unchained and or Batman Triumphant, Schumacher would have returned to direct, but studio execs declined. And yet, the need to change up the Bat formula was obvious. Several new concepts were explored, including Batman Dark Knight, yeah, that's just one word and one K, and an adaptation of the popular futuristic animated take on the character Batman Beyond. By the year 2000, a variety of high-profile Hollywood directors were reportedly pitching Batman stories, but it was the unique team of indie film darling Darren Aronofsky and comics legend Miller who were ultimately hired to take the wheel of Batman Year One. One of the things we thought about was, okay, what do you, you know, what is that going back to Frank Miller look like? And uh, Darren being such a talented young voice, it was a clear uh, you know, signal that we were willing to take a, a, a shift. Aronofsky was the 31-year-old hotshot who had stunned audiences at Sundance with his feature film debut, Pi, two years earlier. The tale of a brilliant but troubled mathematician, the film was a gritty, black-and-white treatise on the very nature of the universe itself, but shot from a ground-level Brooklyn perspective. Who better to steer the Dark Knight away from his recent unfortunate Technicolor fate? My pitch was Death Wish or The French Connection meets Batman, Aronofsky would later say. He wanted to quote, bring an independent gorilla flavor to Batman. Certainly the original comic that the film would be based on was a more down-to-earth take on Batman, depicting, as its title suggests, the first year of young Bruce Wayne's ups and downs as a crime fighter. The story also tracked Jim Gordon's struggles as an honest cop adrift within the corrupt ranks of the Gotham PD. The relationship between Batman and the future Commissioner Gordon would begin here, even as Miller told a more adult story that included themes like prostitution, brutality, and infidelity. Interior. James Gordon's apartment, bathroom. Night. Thunder rolls on the night air. In the sweaty palm of James Gordon rest six bullets. Gordon sits in his boxers on the toilet. In his mouth, he holds his service revolver. Honey, come to bed. Gordon looks up at the door. He puts the gun with its wet barrel into a holster with a badge clipped to the side and leaves the bathroom. 
I'll say at a minimum at Warner Brothers and perhaps, and if you look at it across our business, it might be one of the first times where, you know, somebody like Frank Miller is brought in specifically to get to the heritage of what this thing is, you know. DC had worked with the creators of Batman and worked with the, but it was never treated the same way. It was definitely a different sense of importance. In the book Tales from Development Hell, Aronofsky says, I told them I'd cast Clint Eastwood as the Dark Knight and shoot it in Tokyo, doubling for Gotham City. That got their attention, the filmmaker says, quote unquote, only half joking. When you're alone at night, your rage takes over and you want a revenger. What face do you put with your enemy? It seems the Eastwood concept never made it further than that, but it was enough to get Aronofsky and Warner synced up on year one. And Frank Miller, who had written the original graphic novel as well as the groundbreaking The Dark Knight Returns, which in itself was a major influence on Tim Burton's Batman, was a natural fit to write the script, having also recently worked with Aronofsky on an unproduced screenplay based on his graphic novel Ronin. Fans were generally excited by the notion of this dynamic duo rebooting Batman, and Aronofsky made it clear from the start that he was planning on reinventing the franchise. He told Empire, quote, Frank Miller is writing the screenplay with me, but it's going to be very different than anything in the book year one, and anything you've seen. Toss out everything you can imagine about Batman, everything. We're starting completely anew. And to Salon, he said, I think it's an amazing story that touches very deep in the American consciousness. There's something about vengeance and justice that are really deep issues for Americans, and vigilantism. Once the pair got working on the script, Miller, whose depiction of Batman is known for its ruthlessness and violence, found himself in a unique position. It was the first time I worked on a Batman project with somebody whose vision of Batman was darker than mine. My Batman was too nice for him. We would argue about it, and I'd say Batman wouldn't do that, he wouldn't torture anybody, and so on. Enter the Batman. Two options. Tonight you men can go to prison, or to the prison hospital. The choice is yours. The first goon to recover levels a shotgun. The Batman throws a vicious kick to the guy's crotch before he can fire. That's the one I hoped you'd pick. The Batman leaps into the fray. Talon claws sink into a man's shoulder. He screams as he's thrown through a window. Another thug swings a bat. The Batman kicks him in the chest, grabs his bat from midair, and flings it crunch into the face of another gunner across the room. A guy gets the drop on the Batman with a machine gun. The Batman, VO. There are seven working defenses from this position. Three of them disarm with minimal contact. Three of them kill. The other just hurts. Crack. He throws the maiming sidekick into the guy's hip. Indeed, the Batman in the draft of the screenplay, which can be found online these days, and which appears to be legit based on quotes and references from various personnel involved in the project, including Aronofsky and Miller, depicts a very different Bruce Wayne, and a story that fans will barely recognize from the original Year One comic. The goal was to avoid typical Hollywood trappings, to not shoot on sound stages, but instead in real American inner cities, and to have quote unquote, real fights, exploring, according to Aronofsky, what happens when two men actually fight, which you just don't see. And yet, the goal was to also still, quote, ask that eternal question, what does it take for a real man to put on tights and fight crime? Their Bruce Wayne is a withdrawn loner, working in the auto shop of Little Al, an African-American working-class version of Alfred. Bruce is tormented by nightmares and writes letters to his dead father, which we hear as V.O., asking for guidance while fighting the urge to right the wrongs he sees on the streets of Gotham. One early target of his is a pimp called Chi-Chi, who has a prostitute working for him named Selina. When he finally does embark on his vigilante ways, Bruce wears a signet ring with his father's initials, TW, which, predicting the branding element that would appear 16 years later in Batman v Superman, leaves a bat-shaped scar on his victims. As his crusade against crime continues, he loses all his front teeth, so yeah, picture that Batman, and evolves his approach, developing a homemade bat suit that includes a painted, cut-in-half hockey mask, and hurts a lot of gangsters and thugs. Badly. Eventually, he works his way up the criminal food chain and forms an uneasy alliance with Lieutenant Gordon, one of the only honest cops in the city, to take on the corrupt police commissioner. Familiar faces show up or are hinted at, including Harvey Dent, who's still Gotham's DA at this point, and briefly, a certain green-haired patient in Arkham Asylum. By the end, Bruce has reclaimed his rightful inheritance to the Wayne fortune, has set up a makeshift Batcave in a subway tunnel, and has found his true calling as the Batman. Oh. And he gets himself dentures too, so problem solved there. Exterior. 
dark streets, night. A black Lincoln Continental drives through the bleak, barren streets of Gotham at breakneck speed. It is no ordinary Lincoln Continental. It's the Batmobile. Its windows are tinted opaque. Heavy, steel bumper modifications have been welded to the chassis. The hood has been chopped back to make room for the supercharged school bus engine that powers it. And it drives without headlights, like a car possessed, reckless, and demonic. What Aronofsky and Miller had conceived was a Batman like no other, a hardcore, bloody tale featuring a truly damaged anti-hero and realistic violence. The studio unsurprisingly balked at the script. I think I heard a shriek of horror at first, Miller recalled of the studio's reaction. They were shocked at how bold it was and wanted to be softened as much as it could be, and then we wanted it to be as hard as it could be. Eric Watson, who produced Aronofsky's first three features, told the LA Times in 2005 that Warner execs should have known what to expect, saying, quote, This was the way we pitched it, and that was the script we delivered. They knew what was coming, so their response was definitely confusing. Darren wrote one version, and I wrote one version. Neither got produced. It has to be agreed upon by, by the entire United States Congress before it, before it proceeds. <laughs> Of course, a Batman movie has to serve many masters. And that's why an R-rated film that reads more like Death Wish with a cape than any kind of superhero story was destined to never get made, especially in the early 2000s. Indeed, one of the corporate needs from a movie like this, especially back then, was toys. Batman and Robin! Mr. Freeze wants the shivering shockwave, but heat scan Batman's thermal sensors make Freeze sweat, and now the blazing bat hammer lights up the night! And can't you just picture a collectible Thomas Wayne signet ring, complete with gangster flesh stuck in its grooves? Because, yeah, that's in the script too. Ironically, the very thing that in part led to Batman and Robin's disastrous fate, the merchandising of the property, also meant Aronofsky and Miller's year one would never get made. Reports would follow that high-profile players like Joss Whedon and the Wachowskis pitched their own versions of the Batman origin story, but nothing ever came of those. By 2002, Aronofsky and Miller had moved on as well, as a proposed Batman vs Superman from director Wolfgang Peterson became the hot new DC property at the studio. Eventually, that project fell apart too. Fans finally did get their Batman origin movie in 2005 when Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins was released. The film found a way to balance a more realistic Dark Knight without taking things too far out of the PG-13 realm. Nice. But that doesn't mean shades of Aronofsky and Miller's Year One script didn't find their way into Nolan's trilogy. I don't remember what Chris did or didn't read as he jumped in, but anytime you do a draft like that, everybody reads that draft who comes aboard, right? So those ideas can filter in, you know, Anne Hathaway Catwoman, was that affected by the Aronofsky draft? I have no idea. I find that in the process of developing any big franchise, little ideas somehow find a way when they're good of never dying, no matter how many drafts, no matter how many filmmakers, somehow they keep coming back in, you know? And I, I have no doubt that the exploration of, of Darren's version impacted everything following it to some degree. Now you tell me how much, that's a hard one. Exterior, overgrown garden, dusk. Bruce Wayne stands in a vast classical garden amid weeds and tall grass. Flickering firelight illuminates his face in the gathering gloom of night. Bruce, V.O. December 18. Dear father, you've taught me well. Showed me who I am and what it takes to be a man in this world. For that, I am grateful. Bruce looks down at his cardboard shipping box full of letters burning in a brick fire pit but I am ready to find my own way now. I will make the most of my inheritance, and I will always honor your memory." Bruce holds a final letter in his hands. He looks at it for one more moment, then lets it slip into the flames. Night is falling. I've got work to do. Your loving son, Batman. It's Batman. 